Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special episode of the Property Podcast, because for the first time ever, this is being done in video. Yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this very special Property Podcast. I am Rob D, quite literally with Rob B. This hey, is so weird. Hello. <laughs> That's what you look like. No idea. You're actually quite nice. <laughs> this is thoroughly bizarre. The first time in hundreds of episodes you've actually recorded it in person. And what a place to be doing it's it. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, this place is bonkers. It is. So for anyone who doesn't know, we are on the 64th floor at Deansgate Square. This is actually in a property that you can access via the Portfolio app. So you can go to Portfolio co.uk to find out more about that if you want to get on the waiting list you can do that as well but we thought well we've got a narrow window before the first person moves into this we need to get in here and do a podcast uh, yeah any excuse really yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do a podcast from here that's what we must do and nobody can move in until we've done it because honestly they don't make apartments like this this is just this is just beyond like your wildest dreams of what an apartment could be like. It's absolutely incredible. And if you go over to YouTube, which you must absolutely do, make sure you subscribe because it's going to be the start of more and more content like this. This is the beginning of all those big aspirations we've been talking about. Yeah, property investment is meant to be exciting. Everyone thinks it's exciting all the time. It's not. But sometimes it really is. And today is one of those days. This is awesome. It is. It is awesome. It's so awesome that we're going to skip our usual news story because we want to get into questions because this is also a Q&A special. And these questions, Rob, aren't from us or we've made up ourselves. These are questions from people who've interacted with us via social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram or beyond. So we actually had too many questions. So we're going to edit it down to our favourites. We'll see how many we get through. But there are some crackers in there and I can't wait to get started. And I think you've got a really strong one to get us going with. Okay, so here's our first one. This comes in on Instagram from Property Peep, who asks, do you think house prices are overinflated at the moment? Ooh, I know you're asking the question, but I really actually want to hear your answer. And we've not discussed these answers before. We started recording, so I'm curious. Okay. What do you think? I think you could always find individual instances of properties that are overpriced. Um, although there's an interesting, because if people are, if someone pays the price, is it actually overpriced? And we can maybe talk about that a bit. But the property market as a whole, I don't believe it is, because I think there are reasons why the property market has been strong. Granted, Nobody saw it coming. Everyone got the call completely wrong a year and a half ago when they thought thought what coronavirus was going to do to the property market. But now there are the fundamental reasons why it's performing strongly. When people talk about property being like in a bubble, which is something you hear all the time, the, the definition of a bubble is something where the market is unsupported by fundamentals. It's just people paying more and more and more because they're scared that the price is going to go up further or they think someone else will buy it off them for more than that in the future. And we've seen property markets like that before, 2007. Like That's really what, what it was like. But I'm not getting 2007 vibes. No. Uh, that will come, but I don't think it's there yet. No, I'm, I'm in complete agreement, which is probably no surprise to long-time listeners that we are agreeing again but I agree it's not a mania yet I've got a feeling we can we'll get there and at some point people are just going to view property as some way or some mechanism of making money really really quickly which is something we're against and always have been against it's a long-term investment but there are going to be people people entering the market who will do this to make quick bucks and some of them will and you know some people will get lucky and get in the start of that mania phase and make really quick money and, you know, great luck to them, you know, and they are lucky, but then there'll be people who'll be burned. But right now we're not in that phase. It's only just begun. Like that's, most people really struggle to deal with a new norm and we're in a new norm now. The new norm is the hyper growth phase, but this hasn't happened for a long, long time. This is long actually overdue. London went through a, a massive spur in property prices and it's actually now becoming interesting as a market again, because it's actually been behind in growth terms to inflation so we're falling in real terms for, for many years now so london the market that was booming now is starting to look like it it's got a bit of value but overall yes i'm sure there are some random areas that are overvalued but most of the uk a large proportion to the uk there's still a lot of value in there i mean you have to look at the the affordability levels of a lot of towns and cities across the uk to show that property prices probably can and ultimately will go higher. 
Yeah, you get, you get these narratives in property and people kind of lock onto a way of thinking about the market without really questioning it. And I think one that we're coming into at the moment, I've started hearing more and more, is property price, property is overvalued. People just kind of like take it as an article of faith that it is. But when you actually go and look at some of that data, like different affordability measures, and you look at what's driving it and everything else, it's just not. And the the vibe is so different from how it was. The The mortgage market is not supportive of things going nuts in the same way it did back then. It'll be interesting to see if the kind of the feelings of lenders are going to change as we get into sort of the proper, proper boom phase. Because if you're going to have people really speculating, you kind of need some of the mortgage products and the lax criteria, shall we say, that you saw last time around. Will we get that again? I don't know. But normally there's always rules that were brought in for a very good reason tend to get forgotten exactly when you need them. Yeah, you're right. I think another thing that people are forgetting is inflation. The property market is growing and it is growing a little bit beyond inflation. But it's not left it behind miles and miles and miles. It depends on what figure you believe with inflation, but it's over five percent. It is like in in and in, and depends on what you're buying. It's probably closer to double digits. So if that's the case and property is going up by ten percent, yes, on average it probably is outperforming inflation, but not dramatically so. So inflation is driving a lot of this as well, and and people are seeming to forget that. So in no particular order, because I didn't do that before we started <laughs> recording, I probably should. The next one is, oh, from Anon. I don't think that's their name. I don't think they've left their name. Um, what's the most challenging part of running your business or property portfolio? So there's two parts to that, Rob. Do you, do you want to tackle property first, your property portfolio? Okay, do property first. Um, what's the most challenging part of it? Um no, there's, there's no particular one particularly challenging thing, but something that I've noticed is that there are periods when everything happens all at once. And this is something that's, that even, even happened when I didn't have that much big of a portfolio. It was always the case, even if I just had two properties, like they would both, something would happen at both of them at the same time, and then nothing would happen for a couple of months. And as time's gone on, that just has been exaggerated. I don't know why, but you just get weeks when everything happens all at once. And so if you are self-managing, or even if you're using agents and you've got multiple agents coming to you for things, it can be pretty stressful. But then there's other long stretches of time where you can basically forget you've owned it and it just seems to be one of those weird kind of rules of life that that's the way it goes i don't know why i'm pretty good at like blocking out the the things that go wrong i mean it's only two weeks ago that one of my properties got raided by the police i wasn't in the property <laughs> and it had nothing to do with me um it was to do with the tenant but i was kind of like oh okay well we need to deal with that but it was fine <laughs> this might not might not shock you um but maybe some people listening might be uh, thrown by it but it's the admin for me. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> oh you love god. a good form. Oh god, the forms like like mortgages. We love leverage, and you know we talk about the power of leverage all the time. But oh my god, I nearly want to do it without mortgages because of the paperwork. Like, and it's okay when you have one property, and and you know I understand these are you know very privileged problems to have when you have to fill out more than one mortgage form, but. It's still painful. I still, I'm still allowed to hate it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of sympathy, no. but, but you're allowed to hate it if you want. It's, it's. Um, but there, there is a lot of admin involved, and I think that's something that's else that's important for people to realise. You can never be as hands off as a property investor if you like going down the buy to let route as you would if you had shares. So if you if you invest in the stock market or if you had shares in a REIT, so you had exposure to property, but not through buy to let, you can be completely hands off. You couldn't be hands on if you wanted to. They wouldn't be very interested in your opinion. But when you're doing buy to let, there's always going to be something. <laughs> Just to pause the robs for a minute, I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know that Portfolio has just dropped the minimum investment levels to £5,000. Even if you've got a great agent, they're going to need to come to you for the odd thing. If you're going to have mortgages, then you'll need to do things there. You'll need to talk to your accountant. There's always going to be something. And as your portfolio grows, it means that those are going to be coming around more often, even if it's only the occasional thing, because it's the occasional thing per property, but then you've got more property. So it's something to be aware of. I think you need to go into this knowing that you can't just have this as a purely financial set and forget type investment because things do happen. And I don't think any particular aspect of it is that challenging it could be if you got like emotionally involved in it and it's good that you're not and then you can just kind of go oh yeah please raid fine and that, that's a, that's quite a healthy attitude to have because there's no point getting stressed out about it but some people would but if you can just be kind of emotionally detached then it is just the stuff that needs dealing with 
I appreciate that I'm a little bit different with like stresses and challenges to most people and most people would be thrown by that. So it's, it's easy to say, like, well, don't be stressed by it. You re- most people are either wired by it or not, but try and quickly become aware that you're stressed by it and find perspective, you know, okay, it's bad, but the situation that the raiding falls worse, and, you know, you've kind of got the after effects of it, but it'll get sorted. And, you know, that's, that's why you make your rental profit to, to pay for the bits that go wrong. And so it's kind of just accept that that's part of life and things go wrong and things go right. And you kind of just have to ride with it. I know it's, it sounds very like hippie-ish and just, just go with it, man. But it's just like, it is like you can either, the situation's happened, decide to feel awful about it or decide not to be bothered. It's up to you. You know, it's not, there are a lot, of th- lot worse things that can go on in life and just put it in perspective. I love the fact we speak to each other basically every day, normally multiple times a day. And that just never came up. I didn't know about it until you mentioned it just now. Oh, no, show it's about. crazy. Okay, so let's business. Hardest part of business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a list. Um, but to deflect and give me more time <laughs> and, and maybe not make my answer sound so bad. What's yours? I, I, I think I know what your answer would be and it's going to be the same for me. Um, it's people. <laughs> people <laughs> but not not, not in a not a bad way because like because you know, you know, a, a great the most important thing in business in our business is the people it's a it's a service business and so and so the people is, is everything we we absolutely couldn't do it on our own it, we've tried to do things on our own in the past it hasn't gone very well so so it's it's awesome but when you've got a team of a certain size there's always something going on and I find that far more stressful than anything else. So you could you could have um, you could have money concerns in business, and that can be stressful. But I find emotional people problems so much more stressful than that. Even if there is, even if it's kind of something that solves and it's forgotten about a few days later, I find it very stressful at the time. And I, I know you're the same. Yeah, yeah. You answered it for me. I just wanted you to say it. Um, so. I think I agree with everything you just said. And I think it's because, I think it's important to point out that you also get the most happiness from the people as well. The fact that, you know, someone in the team is really a cool person, wherever you're like, yes, awesome. This makes, they're a fun person to have in the office or what have you. Like, great, I'm so glad they're here. It's when things go wrong, you're either like, it's the wrong person in the business and you're like, oh, gosh, I've made a mistake. Um, you might use different language to that. Or, you know, they're going through some troubles and it's like, oh, I feel for them. Like, that's not that's not cool either. So it's, yeah, it's definitely the part that brings the most stress. The rest, you know, like, oh, this has happened, that's happened. It's like, oh, it's wherever. But, you know, the world is about people, isn't it? And you're like, a, a spreadsheet might not have as many numbers in as you'd like or something goes wrong, but who cares? But like people, that's kind of what the world's made up of. All right, next one. Okay, what have we got next? Um, this one comes in from Andy, who says, are your mortgages paid off? Are they, Rob? <laughs> um, very personal question, Andy. Um, <laughs> no, and partly deliberately so. So my mortgage is paid off enough that I can access um, good rates. I'm talking about my own home here. I don't know if I buy to let. I can answer buy to let separately in a minute. Um, but on my own home, it's got enough equity off it that um i can access the best rates but borrowing is so cheap right now it, it in my mind from my investment decision it'd be crazy to even want or desire to pay it off because interest rate rates are so low so if i'm paying i can't i don't know my exact rate but let's just say it's two percent on my mortgage if i'm paying two percent on my mortgage can i use that money elsewhere to get more than a two percent return well at the moment it's not hard is it so of course i'd rather put my money elsewhere so if i had let's just say £10,000 left in my mortgage. Unfortunately, it's a little more than that. But let's just say I did. Do I want to pay that £10,000 off so I feel good that I've got no mortgage? Or do I want to invest that £10,000 and maybe get 5%, 7% return instead? Well, then it's a numbers game. And it's it's not an emotional decision. But I can understand that people emotionally, because you're taught it all the time, you know, pay your mortgage off, pay your mortgage off, pay your mortgage off, want to pay their mortgage off. But actually... Is it the most savvy thing you can do from a financial point of view? Probably not. No, I've I've gone like so far the other way now that I don't have a home mortgage because I rent. But I actually looked into 
buying a home to live in because I wanted the mortgage because it's just like, because the debt is so cheap and it's like being inflated away faster than you're paying interest on it. So it's like, I'm just like, I'm re- as, a, as a financial decision, I'd want to get the biggest mortgage I could at the moment and just lock it in and that'd be awesome. Turn out for lifestyle reasons, I just couldn't justify it. I actually don't want to own, but it's like, oh, I'm it's quite tempted just for that reason and it's the same on um sort of on the buy to let portfolio i don't i don't know what my loan to value is i don't deliberately max it out i don't keep pulling out equity every chance i get but it would seem crazy to pay it off at the moment when rates are so cheap it's it's literally free money in many cases because it's just it's it's good pay inflation is whatever we said it was and your interest rates sub two percent why wouldn't you so let's see what our next question. And it's in from Matt, and it was, came in via Facebook. So the stats tell us the average house price has gone up about 10%, or about 30K on average, um, although people have spent about 10K on renovations. In other words, are we better off buying a completely new house instead? Are the stats to show us that a homeowner has spent on a house, and how much has it risen by because they spent the money on the house? So basically... Is everything gone up because everyone's been renovating their homes? I think that's part of the question. Um, and even if that was true, which we'll quickly get to, isn't. Even if that's true, I think moving house, I think people forget that beyond the stress, there's actually a lot of cost involved. And this is one of my big bugbears is the cost of moving home. So I think it really clogs up the market because more people would probably move home if there weren't so many costs associated with it, particularly tax. But moving to a sideways move to a new home unless you've got more money and you're moving to a bigger property if you're looking to buy another property but just a newer version of it or just another property it's not it's not efficient to do the only time really it's efficient to move house and obviously sometimes there can be emotional reasons to move house so i'm talking from a finance point of view the only reason it's efficient is if you're going up or down because you're either going, you're moving up the ladder or down the ladder but moving across the ladder it's, it just actually ends up costing you money. And in a way, you probably take one step back because of all the costs involved. Yeah, which is bad for mobility, which is bad for productivity. But you see, like if, you live, if you lived in one, not even like one city, but like one, one part of London, say, and there is a job in, a, on the other side of London, if you want to move from a three bed of a certain size to another three bed of that size elsewhere in London, the stamp duty is going to be a fortune. So you're, you're not going to make that move. You're just not going to do it. To move house in London, stamp duty is a six figure number for most parts of London. You know, that's a crazy amount of money. So no wonder everyone's doing renovations. It's because yeah. they can't afford to move house. No, so I think that's that's the answer. Like, why has the market gone up? Is it because people have been renovating? No, it's because the market has gone up. It's been lifted by various factors, but it's not that everyone suddenly got very handy. A lot of people have. It's very hard to get a builder because everyone's very busy sort of doing extensions. But that's the people who are not moving, and those those are not being used as comps to justify other prices elsewhere. It's just a different thing. So lots of people are doing work on their homes because they can't move because there's no stock or they don't want to move because of stamp duty or whatever but the whole I agree, i'm with you on the stamp duty that's tax is such a weird thing because you in so many cases tax is used as to disincentivize things so there's a reason that there's tax on cigarettes and alcohol and things like that but then you also tax people's wages which is weird and you tax them moving house when you kind of you don't want to add friction to that market so it's it doesn't make a lot of sense and that is the reason why i don't think i don't think anyone moves as much as they should do really yeah no i think you're right i think we all stay in our homes a lot longer than possibly we'd all want because because of that and i understand why you rent it gives you that flexibility you know people often in society go oh you know well, why haven't you bought your own home yet if you're renting but actually renting brings you a lot of choice and a lot of flexibility and and i think more and more people are opening their eyes to that because Moving home is a very expensive business. It is, and I'd much prefer it if it were easier and easier because the, the process, we haven't even touched on the process of moving houses, t- of like transacting in property at all, is terrible. It's an absolute nightmare, and it's expensive. So no wonder people don't do it. No, no. Well, this could turn into a massive round. So before it does, let's do the next question. Okay. Uh, Chris Jones from Facebook says, the Robs seem to champion single buy-to-let as their favoured property strategy, but I would love to hear their views about HMOs, the pros and the cons. We champion it because it's our favourite. And probably for most people, not all, for most people, it probably is the, the best strategy for them, whether you do it via a fund or yourself. 
but there is a place for HMOs and there is a place for people, you know, doing them because they they suit it through their goals and their strategy. So let's start with why would you do HMO over standard buy to let? Let's just assume you know, we all like standard buy to let, so we don't need to do a versus thing. So why would people choose a HMO strategy? Let's start with the pros. So it says higher yield, right? Are there, are there any others? That's, that's all the obvious. Well, that, that's it, really. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the money. You, you're going to make a higher rental return. And I think that suits people who are trying to possibly hit a financial goal a little faster than normal. Because most of your money in property, most of your wealth, I should say, is created through capital growth. And that's, that's you know, true. It can't be debated. It is. But you can enhance your rental returns by taking the HMO approach. So... If you do that, you know, if you're, for example, desperate to get out of your work, the type of job you do, maybe you don't like it anymore. I find a lot of pharmacists hate their jobs. Oh, really? Lot, yeah, <laughs> I find a lot of IT contractors as well. A lot of them are like desperate to get out. That's, you know, when I've spoken to them. And they want to exit their their world as quickly as they, they can. So HMO potentially, because there is downsides, potentially could be a great avenue for them because it'll get them to that financial goal a little faster. Yeah, so I think that is exactly the situation. And especially if you've got a, say you've got a defined amount of money and you want to use that to get out of your job or go part-time or do whatever as soon as you can, that makes sense. So let's just say you could achieve double the yields. I don't think you actually can, but let's just say you could. So if you're making £800 per property instead of 400 you manage to get three of them, then it's like, brilliant, that's enough for me. I'm able to quit. And that's that, that even if you get less capital growth over time because of the location or the type of property, even if it's more hassle, still totally worth it because you've achieved your goal. You had a short-term goal and it's allowed you to achieve that short-term goal. If you are investing for the for the long term and you are looking at this kind of concept of total return, where it's your rental income and your capital growth, then you're making okay, you're making less per month, but potentially you're saving a lot of time, which you need to put a value on, and you're going to get greater capital growth over time because HMOs tend to be the type of property in the type of location that's not going to be first in line, like, un- unlike where we are today. Like this is the, like this would not work as an HMO. No, I but mean it'd be one hell of a HMO, <laughs> but yeah, it's not going to work. But it's probably going to do pretty well for capital growth compared to somewhere on the outskirts that's. Um, little bit less fancy let's say so i think that it it has its place for that reason but it does completely depend on your on your goal i think the the downsides are pretty obvious i mean it is mainly the fact the hassle factor the fact that you've got um, if you've got multiple rooms and you say let's say you've got five rooms and they're sort of turning the average tenancy term is like six months because things tend to be a bit more transient then it means you're basically always dealing with a change of tenancy which is which is work and cost if you're using an agency because they'll charge you a letting fee every time so i think that's that's a kind of a fairly obvious drawback and that ties into i think where people get hmo is wrong in that they go into it looking at the headline rate of what you could achieve not realizing that actually by the time you deduct all the different costs that you've got that you don't have with normal buy to let is it higher yield yeah probably but how much higher and is it higher enough to make it worthwhile yeah it's yeah there's a big one for me and people overlook this in whatever they do with whatever strategy and property they take but you do have to value your time and you will, depending on your strategy, allocate so much time towards it. You know, even with standard buy to let, as we talked about, it's like taking the calls from the letting agent because someone's raided your property or uh, dealing with the paperwork. But if you think that's a lot, well, HMOs is a whole different world because in that property, instead of having one tenant to deal with, you've now got four or five, six. That's four, five, six different personalities. One of them leaves, you've got a void. You know, so suddenly you've got to find someone else to bring in. You've got more maintenance issues. Yes, it's a great strategy strategy for some people, but it's clear, you know, why it isn't right for us as individuals and clear why it isn't right for most other people. A lot of people see the shiny end product of, oh, extra income, but either don't think through, the you know, what they're going to have to do to get there or just block it out and go, you know, I'm focused on this end goal and I'll just conveniently forget all these other things I'm going to have to accept. Now, if you go into it with eyes wide open and you're happy to do that, then fantastic. But just make sure you are going in eyes wide open. Definitely. 
Cool. Right. Okay. Have we got another one? We have. Okay. So this one's from David on Instagram. How do you think an investor can differentiate themselves from the competition in all aspects? Hmm. Interesting one. So well, let's start by like listing out some some aspects like how well why would you why do you need to differentiate yourself as a as a starting point so you you put you put your property uh, up on right move or whatever what's the, the the purpose of differentiating yourself is so get it let faster to a better quality of tenant at a higher rent so you need to give them the motivation to do those things so that kind of leads you into ways of differentiating i think one is the sort of is visual that's probably the most important because the standard is pretty low. And if you can make your make your own property stand out more, so you get more, the phone rings more times, you get more viewings, that's naturally going to translate into more choice for you in terms of tenant and be supportive of a higher rent. So I think that that is a good opportunity for differentiating yourself without actually spending much more or putting in that much more effort. And then the the other one that comes to mind is once you've got that tenant in there, keeping hold of them because contrary to what the media would have you to believe sometimes landlords don't want to kick their tenants out every six months for no reason they want them to stay because it's more profitable and it's easier so to keep them there you can differentiate on service and again i don't think that means you have to do anything particularly crazy because the standard of service is normally really bad so if you can just be responsive and pleasant and easy to deal with and fix things quickly that is enough to make you stand out. And that that is therefore accomplished sort of getting someone in faster at a higher rent who's less likely to cause you trouble and will stay there for the long term. So that's two kind of very quick, easy bits of differentiation that have real results. I like what you've done there. And you've kind of focused on the the owning part. So I suppose the other two parts are when you're starting out and then, you know, actually finding that property that you're after. For the starting out, I think it's most people just stumble into property investment or or attempt to stumble in or kind of do the minimum needed and the fact that you know david's interacting with our socials and hopefully he's watching this hi if you are um means that he's probably going to be fine and he already is standing out because he's putting that effort in he's curious to learn and for me people who you know I'm biased, but I'm sure everyone who's listening and watching will want to hear this. I think people who put the time and effort in to learn and educate themselves and come up with a better strategy are probably going to outperform all other investors because you're showing that you're in the minority. You're the ones who are willing to go to that extra level. And then with sourcing deals, I think it's just effort again, like picking the best investments, whether it's finding a really good um, company or individual sources to work with to find those deals or putting the effort in yourself that others aren't willing to do you know other people want to just trawl right move make a call possibly do a viewing and put an offer in but are you willing to meet sourcing companies or individual sources vet them pick the one that you feel is the best or look at areas that other people aren't picking up on or watching the videos of best places to invest things like that just point again just going okay what does everyone else do? What are one or two things extra that I could do that's just going to take me to that next level? And then you're in, you are then in the minority. And that's where you want to be because you're ahead of the competition. Definitely. Okay, should we move on? Let's do it. Okay. Um, this one comes in from Rebecca. This is a really interesting question. It says, have you got an end goal? For example, when I hit 1 million in, in assets, I'll stop investing. Do you have an end goal? For property investment, which is obviously what it's aimed at, yes, which I know it's going to sound weird being hesitant because we talk about goals all the time. And I had a goal early on, and, and I, I'm pleased to say I hit that goal. But for me now, it's it's about investing in assets when I have any surplus of cash and um we reinvest a lot of money into the business, so that's not as frequent as I'd like. But um, I, I'd say it's just doing that now to make sure that my money, my goal, I guess, now is about making sure my money works as hard as possible for me when I choose to invest it. So I suppose the answer to the question is I hit my original goal, which I'm very lucky to do, and it wasn't to dramatically change my lifestyle. It was more of a financial stability goal and the nest egg and the protection if anything went wrong in the future and then that'll transition into you know a legacy play in the future as well 
But for now, it's just about making sure that when I choose to invest, it's making any money that I have work as hard as possible. I wish I had something more different to say because mine's ah. going to be quite similar. Um, I think it's it's the same. It's like I, I had a goal that was meaningful for me, achieved it, and now I kind of don't. And I think that's all right because both of us have got goals for other areas of life, primarily business. So I think it's dangerous to not have any kind of goal because it means you're you're not motivated to to do the work that's needed and you could end up going too far i've said this on the podcast before because it sounds it sounds weird but it's true like i literally know someone who ended up owning 200 properties because he didn't know when to stop like he did it was just it was just what he did that's a good addictive personality yeah, like, that's that. like when it's uh, like I, I just eat loads of chocolate like, <laughs> that's that's really good yeah but it's, but i don't do but would you really want to own 200 properties no, like, no. and i don't, I don't I don't think he did and, and he was like, like he just sort of like woke up one day and he did which is, and this you know this was more than 10 years ago when it was easier to do that it's a lot more challenging to do that, that now so you're not going to stumble into the, uh, owning a small village but <laughs> you, but it's like it is weird to go by by not having a goal you could either not go far enough or you can go too far because you don't know where to stop and I think when it comes to when it comes to money obviously being in a position where you end up doing too much is a great position to be in because it's a lucky position to have too much but you do get people who are worth hundreds of millions or even billions who just keep on working kind of too hard because they don't have a goal they don't know when to stop and so I think basically what I'm saying is having a goal is important that so the fact that we don't have a specific property goal doesn't mean that we're not practicing what we preach it's just that our focus is elsewhere at the moment yeah okay cool Let's see if we disagree on the answers on the next one. Ah, we might do. You never know. So this is from By Night on Instagram. I'm curious to know why you don't recommend Birmingham as one of the best places to invest in. The city is going through enormous infrastructure developments and the house prices are relatively good. Why don't you like Birmingham, Rob? This is a horrible place. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's not. Oh, no, it's that happen- is not getting into stuff. <laughs> uh, it's going to happen again. I've offended yet another major city. There's, there's a million people you just offended. Yeah, no, I, I am joking. Um, well, it's the reason we didn't mention it is the same reason that we didn't mention about 50 other places. And so we did a webinar about um, about our best places to invest this year. And like we all, like always happens, the comments are just full of, what about this place? What about that place? I've got nothing against any of them, but we've just picked out certain locations based on that we think are particularly strong or where there's an interesting angle on it or something like that, that we, if we mentioned every possible place that you could make a good investment in the country, it would go on forever and not be very helpful. So from my side, at least, we didn't exclude Birmingham because there's anything wrong with it. There's not. It can be a great place to invest, but it just wasn't on our did it just wasn't on our list because there was only like, what, four or five places on it? Yeah, but it was very close to being because yeah. you're right, Knight. It, it does have incredible infrastructure projects you know there's a million people who live there for a reason it's you know we've got so much going for it hs2 is still going there there's loads and loads of good news around birmingham and i'm a huge fan and our business property hub invest is actively trying to source property there amongst all the other places we've mentioned as well because we do rate it so highly so we haven't got a anti-birmingham thing going on it just didn't make that top four or five but it would definitely make our top 10. So that's cool. Top 10's still good. Top 10's fine. Yeah. All right, Rob. So how's the first video podcast been? I would do another one. Oh, that's nice. But only if we can do it here again. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Well, if you are still listening to this, have not viewed this yet, then please go and check out YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Honestly, it'll be the best click you've done all year because it will then open you up to seeing all the other stuff that we've got planned. And make sure you stick around to the very end because we'll give you a little bit more of a tour. There's going to be a little bit more to watch and enjoy. And we hope that we can bring you more content like this very soon because, to be honest, this has been an absolute pleasure. It really has. But yeah, we need to stop now because I need to go off and take more pictures of the view. But we will be back with the podcast again next Thursday. We will be back in our spare bedrooms, unfortunately, but the podcast will go on and I'm sure we're going to have a great episode as well. Although I might take some of this furniture with me. (laughs) Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.